Hey future real estate pros, it's Maggie here, your go-to guide for all things real estate. Today we're gonna go over the top 20 terms you need to know for your real estate exam. So grab your notebook and let's get started. First up, deed restrictions. These are private agreements that restrict the use of real property and are often put in place by developers to maintain certain standards in a neighborhood. Deed restrictions are sometimes called restrictive covenants and are private agreements that limit how property can be used. These restrictions are typically written into the deed by the property developer or homeowners association to maintain a certain standard within a community. For example, deed restrictions might dictate the type of structures that can be built, the materials that must be used, or even the colors that houses can be painted. Violating deed restrictions can lead to legal action. So as a real estate professional, you'll need to know if there are any restrictions that apply to properties you are helping others buy or sell. Make sure you also know how deed restrictions can affect the value and use of the property. Next, we have the legal test for fixtures. When it comes to determining whether something is a fixture and therefore part of the property sale, the MARIA test is your best friend. MARIA stands for Method of Attachment, Adaptability of the Item, Relationship of the Parties, Intention of the Person Placing the Item, and Agreement between the Parties. For example, a chandelier screwed into the ceiling, which would be method, and specifically chosen for the home, intention, would likely be considered a fixture. Knowing Maria helps avoid disputes over what stays and what goes in a real estate transaction. If you'd like to learn more about the differences between real and personal property, check out my video all about real versus personal property in the link provided in the description box below. Number three, how to become a realtor. To become a realtor, you must be a licensed real estate agent. Then you join the National Association of Realtors or NAR, which provides access to additional resources like the Multiple Listing Service or MLS, training opportunities and a professional network. More importantly, realtors must adhere to a strict code of ethics, which emphasizes fair dealing, honesty, and protecting the rights of property owners. This designation shows clients you are committed to a higher standard of professionalism. It's good to note that not every real estate agent is a realtor. Understanding what qualifies a real estate agent to use the title realtor might come up as a question on your exam. Number four, non-conforming use. A non-conforming use situation occurs when a property's use doesn't align with current zoning laws, but was legally established under prior zoning regulations. For example, a small grocery store operating in a residential zone because it was established before the residential zone was enacted. Non-conforming uses are typically what is considered grandfathered in, meaning they can continue as is, but if the use is discontinued for a period of time, the right to that use may be lost and the new tenant must conform to the new zoning laws. Number five, antitrust regulations or price fixing. Antitrust regulations are designed to promote fair competition and prevent monopolies. In real estate, price fixing is one of the most critical violations to avoid. This illegal activity involves brokers agreeing to set fixed commission rates, which can lead to a lack of competition and higher costs for consumers. Understanding these regulations is so important to conduct business ethically and lawfully, ensuring a competitive market that benefits everyone. Make sure to associate the terms price fixing with antitrust regulations and the Sherman Act. Moving on to number six, lead-based paint. Properties built before 1978 may have lead-based paint. Sellers must disclose this to buyers as exposure can cause serious health issues. 
Lead-based paint is a serious health hazard, particularly in homes built before 1978, when its use was banned in residential properties. Sellers of homes constructed before this date must provide buyers with a lead-based paint disclosure outlining any known hazards and provide even a pamphlet that details the risks. This federal requirement was created to protect occupants, especially children, from the harmful effects of lead poisoning, which can cause developmental issues and other severe health problems. Make sure you know the rules surrounding this disclosure. Moving on to number seven, zoning. Zoning laws govern how property in certain areas can be used, whether for residential, commercial, or industrial purposes in different parts of a city or municipality. There are several types of zoning, including residential, commercial, industrial, and agricultural. Zoning regulations control aspects like the types of buildings allowed, lot sizes, building heights, and density of development. Understanding zoning is a very important concept in real estate as it affects property values and potential uses, influencing investment decisions, and guiding buyers and sellers accordingly. Number eight, economic and functional obsolescence. These two terms are often confused. Economic obsolescence or external obsolescence refers to a loss in property value caused by external factors outside of the homeowner's control, such as nearby highway or declining neighborhood conditions. Functional obsolescence, on the other hand, occurs when a property becomes outdated or less useful due to design or architectural features, like having only one bathroom in a three-bedroom home. Functional obsolescence can also be considered an over-improvement to the home, so look out for that on your exam. Both forms of obsolescence can affect the marketability and valuation of a property. Number nine, specific performance. In contract law, specific performance is a legal remedy in real estate transactions where a court orders the breaching party to fulfill their contract obligations rather than simply paying monetary damages. This term is often relevant in real estate purchase agreements. It's commonly found in real estate because each piece of property is unique, making monetary compensation insufficient. For example, if a seller tries to back out of a signed sales contract, the buyer might sue for specific performance to force the sale of the property. Number 10, option contracts. An option contract gives one party, usually the buyer, the right but not the obligation to purchase a property at a set price within a specific time frame. Option contracts are unilateral, meaning only one party, the seller, is bound by a promise to sell if the buyer chooses to exercise the option. These contracts are common in scenarios where buyers need time to secure financing or decide on a property's suitability. It's a type of unilateral contract because only one party has made a promise. Don't forget the words unilateral and option contracts as that word unilateral may show up on the answers and then you know which answer to choose. Number 11, commingling. Commingling refers to mixing client funds with personal funds, which is a big no-no in real estate. Keeping client funds separate is critical to maintain trust and legality. This is a serious breach of ethical standards and legal regulations. For example, if a buyer provides a deposit for a property, that money must be placed in a separate escrow account, not in the agent's or broker's personal or business bank account. Keeping funds separate protects both the agent and the client and It'll ensure transparency in all financial transactions. It's really the only way to maintain trust and avoid legal issues. Moving on to number 12, exclusive listings. There are two main types of exclusive listings and you have to know the difference between the two. Exclusive right to sell and exclusive agency. In an exclusive right to sell listing, the broker earns a commission regardless of who sells the property. 
even if the owner finds a buyer independently. So we can say an exclusive right to sell listing agreement gives the broker the highest protection. Now in an exclusive agency listing, the owner keeps the right to sell the property themselves without paying a commission to the broker. But the agent still has the exclusive right to market the property. Understanding these differences helps agents structure their listing agreements effectively. Know the differences. Number 13, void or voidable contracts. These terms are often mixed up on the exam and I want to clarify them for you. A void contract is one that is legally enforceable from the beginning. For example, a contract to do something illegal is void. So if there is an illegal subject matter, void is your answer. Now, a voidable contract, however, is valid and enforceable unless one party chooses to void it due to specific circumstances, like misrepresentation, fraud, or duress. For instance, if a minor signs a contract, it is voidable because minors lack the legal capacity to enter binding agreements. You may also see it show up on the exam as if somebody was drunk and signed a contract. That would make the contract voidable. Knowing how to identify void and voidable contracts can help you get those answers correct when taking your exam. So just to recap, a void contract has no legal effect and is unenforceable. A voidable contract is one that can be canceled by one party, often due to some form of misrepresentation or fraud. Number 14, blockbusting and steering. Blockbusting and steering are illegal practices under the Fair Housing Act. Let's begin with blockbusting. Blockbusting involves scaring homeowners into selling their homes by suggesting that a particular group of people are moving into the neighborhood and will decrease their property value. Panic selling is a good keyword for this. Steering, on the other hand, involves guiding potential home buyers or renters towards or away from a certain neighborhood based on their race, ethnicity, religion, or other protected characteristics. Both practices are illegal and unethical. Number 15, liquidated damages. Liquidated damages are a prearranged amount set in a contract that one party will pay to the other in the event of a breach. In real estate, these are often included in purchase agreements to outline what the buyer must forfeit if they back out of the deal without a valid reason. Liquidated damages provide a measure of certainty and protection for both buyers and sellers, ensuring that parties are compensated for their losses. This is often included in real estate contracts to set the terms of any breach penalties. Think of liquid as money readily accessible in a bank account, just like a buyer's earnest money deposit is in an escrow account. Number 16, promissory note. A promissory note is a financial instrument that acts as a written promise from the borrower to repay a specified amount of money, typically with interest to the lender. In real estate, promissory notes are commonly used in mortgage transactions. The note outlines the terms of repayment, including the interest rate and payment schedule. It's an important document because it serves as the borrower's commitment to repay the loan and is legally binding. Number 17, PMI or private mortgage insurance. Private mortgage insurance or PMI is insurance that private lenders require from home buyers who make a down payment of less than 20% of the home's purchase price. PMI protects the lender in case the borrower defaults on the loan. Although PMI benefits the lender, not the borrower, it allows buyers to purchase homes with a smaller down payment, making home ownership more accessible. This type of mortgage insurance is found on conventional or private loans. Number 18, ARM or adjustable rate mortgage. An adjustable rate mortgage or an ARM has an interest rate that may change periodically, depending on changes in a corresponding financial index that's tied to the loan. Arms typically start with a lower fixed rate for an initial period, like five years. Then they adjust annually. This lower initial rate can be attractive, but it comes with a risk of increasing rates later on. 
leading to higher monthly payments. The key word when you are faced with these types of questions on the real estate exam is index. Think of an index as a benchmark interest rate that reflects general market conditions. It serves as a baseline for lenders to determine the interest rates on arms. The index rate can go up or down over time depending on economic factors. So keyword when it comes to arms is index. Number 19, contingency. Contingencies are conditions that must be met for a real estate contract to become binding. Common contingencies include financing, like the buyer securing a mortgage, an inspection, and even an appraisal where the property has to appraise at or above the sales price. If a contingency isn't met, the buyer can typically withdraw from the contract without penalty. Knowing how to structure contingencies in a contract protects both buyers and sellers during the transaction process. And number 20, approaches to value. There are three main approaches to valuing real estate. The sales comparison approach, the cost approach, and the income approach. The sales comparison approach looks at recent sales of similar properties or comparables to estimate value. It's what we use as real estate agents to price a property. We are selling or helping a buyer place their best offer. The cost approach estimates what it would cost to replace or reproduce the property considering depreciation. This is used for new construction or for public or government type buildings like hospitals, libraries, schools, etc. The income approach is used mainly for investment properties and is based on the income the property generates. Think apartment buildings. Each approach is used depending on the type of property and the purpose of the valuation. If you want more information on how these three approaches are used and when they are used, I'll leave a link to my video all about the three approaches to value down in the description box below. That's a wrap on our top 20 real estate exam terms. Understanding these concepts will give you the confidence you need to ace your exam and start your real estate career on the right foot. If you'd like to dive deeper into really making sure you learn these terms, grab a copy of my ebook, The Educated Agent, A Savvy Guide to Real Estate. That's full of all the vocabulary you need to know for your exam, no matter what state you're in. Learn the concepts with our easy to follow guide, practice sample questions, and pass your exam on the first try. You can get even more bang for your buck if you pair the vocabulary ebook with our Math for Real Estate Success ebooks, volume one and volume two. It's the real estate exam perfect trio. And We'll have you solving those math problems in no time. I'll leave a link for you below in the description box so you can make sure to get your copy today. Remember, practicing questions is your best bet when it comes to passing your real estate exam. Make sure to hit that notification bell because you're not going to want to miss our next video where we're going to give you 20 practice questions all about these terms to test your knowledge. Thank you so much for tuning in today for more about contracts, which will be the biggest section on your exam. Make sure to check out the video that's appearing on your screen right now. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and leave us a comment if you're ready for more tips and tricks on how to pass your real estate exam. See you next time. And remember, just call Maggie.